Mm -hmm. okay. So let's all bow in. And welcome to the Buddhist path, <laughs> the Buddhist path of awakening course. And we are working our way once again through some chapters in uh, the Profound Treasury of the Ocean of Dharma, Volume 1, uh, especially on Vipassana and Shamatha and Vipassana. Michael, you want to take it away? Okay, so welcome everyone. And yes, we're continuing <clears throat> reading through the chapters on Vipassana meditation in the Profound Treasury. I'm going to be speaking mostly about chapter 47, investigating the subtleties of experience. But before I start on that chapter, I wanted to just rewind a little back to the first chapter in this section, uh, the title, the chapter titled The Freshness of Unconditioned Mind, where uh, Trungpa Rinpoche says that Vipassana depends on several conditions, but primarily, fundamentally, comes from being without aggression. Um, and the definition of aggression here is different from what we might ordinarily think. Ordinarily, we think of aggression as some kind of violence or harmful action. But in this case, he's really talking about aggression, to begin with at least, on the level of mind, where uh, any time that we want things to be different from what they are, we're engaging in some subtle act of aggression. Uh, we're engaging in uh, some kind of demand that things be the way we want them to be. Um, and out of this, <clears throat> out of this comes all, can come all kinds of controlling behavior. And when it manifests on the level of speech, it can be anything from just, you know, just quickly snapping to political demagogues. On the level of action, it can be anything from, you know, fairly mild behavior up to wars. But aggression begins with that sense that we want something to be different than what it is, want things to be different. And out of that comes all kinds of activities where we try to manage or control things around us. And Trungpa Rinpoche connects this with confusion and speed, speed of mind, where uh, we jump to our conclusions about what things are see our ideas of things rather than actually seeing the thing itself. Um, now, obviously, of the three clashes, passion, aggression, and ignorance, passion and ignorance also play a role here. But aggression in particular really relates to rejection and pushing things away. Uh, and when we engage in that, uh, we're, rather than superior seeing, which is Vipassana, we're not seeing at all or we're seeing just our version of things. So this is what he's talking about, I think, and understanding that the Pashna awareness fundamentally comes from being without aggression. So uh, chapter 47 is titled The Subtleties of Experience, Investigating the Subtleties of Experience. Uh, like the chapter that I presented last week, this is one of the chapters in this volume that's actually based on a single seminary talk. Uh, as opposed to um, a compendium of several talks on the same topic. And in particular, this comes from the 1979 seminary. Um, and once again, it was interesting to go back and look at the uh, specific transcript. Actually, the 79 seminary is interesting because of how much Trungpa Rinpoche's talks related to the practice of meditation. In this seminary, he presented the obstacles to shamatha practice, the antidotes to shamatha practice. He presented the nine techniques of resting the mind, um, nine stages of shamatha, as it's sometimes called. All of this before uh, talk, beginning to talk about Vipassana. Um, and in the reading that we did for tonight in the Profound Treasury, some of his introductory comments to, before he started talking about Vipassana uh, were uh, edited out. But the, the gist of it was that he really encouraged his students in this seminary talk, uh, if you could imagine yourself being there for just a moment, to be faithful to shamatha practice. Uh, that um, he was, in talking about Vipassana, he said he's going on to more theoretical things or experiences that we might have at some point, but that it was important to be faithful to shamatha practice. Um, 
And remember again that uh, the way that the seminary was structured, that seminary began with two weeks of fairly intensive meditation practice, something like 10 to 12 hours a day for two full weeks. And then the study period would begin and Trungpa Rinpoche would speak. And even during the study period, there's at least three hours of meditation every day, um, as well as other classes and his talks usually in the evenings. So uh, again, he really asked people to be faithful to their shamatha practice. And he gave some reasons for that. And this is kind of where the, uh, the reading that we did begins. He said that a realization and understanding of shamatha will help you hear the teachings properly. And what this means is that through shamatha practice, by allowing ourselves to settle, engage in calm abiding, allowing us that we become present and available to the teachings, we're able to hear. Uh, as he says, uh, we need to hear the whole thing that in his talks, he's presenting instructions and it would be like getting directions, but missing some of the directions. So we didn't make a left turn when we needed to make the turn. So it's very important through shamatha practice to allow ourselves to be available, to be uh, present. Um, he says in the transcript that Vipassana discipline comes out of shamatha discipline. It comes from having a greater reference point. Uh, and again, in chapter 43, uh, the, the first chapter that we read in this section on Vipassana, he says that with Vipassana, the precision of mindfulness practice continues, but with more freedom. Again, greater reference point, more of a sense of other, more of a sense of environment. Um, in this chapter that we've read, so I'm skipping back and forth a little bit, but trying to give a little bit more context here. He says that Vipassana is the insight that brings you to realize things very clearly and fully. The reference point of Vipassana includes both meditation and post-meditation experience. With Vipassana, there is no gap of any kind between sitting and non-sitting. Your entire life is pure awareness. So Shamatha creates the ground that allows for Vipassana awareness to develop. But Vipassana ultimately is awareness practice. It's not simply being mindful in the sense of being present, but being awake, aware. As we talked about last week, there's a knowing quality to Vipassana. There's a noticing quality. There's a creative quality to Vipassana. Um, and all of this develops out of shamatha practice. But um, as he said, actually, in the very next talk, he says the problem with in, that's in the 1979 seminary, he says that the shamatha only becomes a problem when we make a shelter out of it when we use it to, again, actually avoid experience rather than opening up to experience. So, um, but once we are, as he says in this chapter, captivated, or you could say settled by shamatha discipline, we begin to ask ourselves, and again, this is a question that if you were at seminary and you've been sitting for two weeks and then began hearing talks and taking classes, you might ask yourself the question that he asked in this chapter, how am I going to study the Dharma? How am I going to make this work for me? Uh, and he says this kind of inquisitive mind and awareness is the beginning of not only being a good sitter, a good meditation, in other words, a good meditator, but also a good student of Dharma. So again, uh, Vipassana is connected with that sense of inquisitiveness, curiosity, looking altogether looking further, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, and he says, he goes on to say, this is why prajna is important, prajna, discriminating awareness wisdom. Prajna is connected with awareness, and awareness is a result of being perked up by shamatha. So again, there's a, um, a very a summary description of what we're all together working with here, that through shamatha, uh, vipassana arises, and through vipassana, we develop prajna, discriminating awareness wisdom. And just to take prajna to Further, it's through prajna that we ultimately recognize, realize, perceive emptiness, which um, we've been doing quite a bit of study on in recent weeks. Trungpa Rinpoche says that with shamatha, you develop delight and joy, as if you've just had a good appetizer. And with vipassana now, you wonder what the actual meal will be. But the appetizer continues throughout the whole meal. So the sh shamatha practice doesn't stop. Well, that's, that's the point. It develops into Vipassana, but uh, it doesn't stop. It's not that um, we leave shamatha behind so much as we allow Vipassana to develop.
Um, and with shamatha, we experience delight and joy. Um, and there are different ways in which we might realize this. In one sense, it's as simple as, again, the line in the chant. Um, that uh, with Vipassana, oh, sorry, with shamatha, our present experience is fresh, it's vivid, it's clear, uh, it's not stale, it's not, we're not as caught up in um, our preconceptions of things, we're not caught up as much in seeing our ideas of things, but we actually begin to see things as they are, right in the mo right on the spot. Um, and there's also with Vipassana, oh, sorry, with shamatha, <laughs> With shamatha, um, a sense of relief. There's a sense of, again, the absence of struggle, that we're not um, as caught up in our anxiety, our hopes and fears, and our struggle. And that this is ultimately um, what leads to the kind of non aggression that allows Vipassana to develop. Uh, he says in this chapter that Vipassana and shamatha are fundamentally inseparable. Which is interesting because going back to chapter 43, he also said that they're entirely different. But um, it really depends in how the context in which shamatha and vipassana are being talked about. In the strictest sense of shamatha, which he does get into in um, this chapter a little bit, um, you're just coming back, coming back, coming back. And as he says in some of the previous chapters, there's a lot of cutting down, cutting down. With vipassana, there's some relaxation, there's an opening up. Um, it's not as much um, as rigidly uh, effortful, and it's, it's not as effortful as uh, shamatha is. Um, matter of fact, in one of the previous chapters that we read in this section, he says that in the beginning, um, when people, when a meditator begins to experience vipassana, they might feel that they're being somewhat um, disloyal, I can't think of a better word, disloyal to shamatha practice, because there is this opening up, there's more of a sense of environment, but it's not in the confused sense, it's not in the speedy sense, it's not in the grasping or uh, choosing and rejecting sense, it's just purely openness. Um, and that's really what uh, Vipassana is. He also says that shamatha and Vipassana work together. Um, in the again in this talk in the 1979 transcript when he defines vipassana or laktang in tibetan uh, most often this is translated as superior seeing sometimes it's insight but in this particular talk he actually describes it as further seeing or seeing further and in fact often his instruction to students in, in various talks was to look further which is all about what the four categories of vipassana are looking further looking more deeply into things with an open mind, the mind that's not already uh, closed with preconceptions or judgments, not already applying labels and definitions and ideas to things, but that's open in the sense of um, being able to just see. So there are four categories of Vipassana that it talks about here. Uh, I will say in other teachings, I've heard them also described as the four actions of prajna, so again, there's a connection between Vipassana developing prajna. But the basic idea of all of it is that as we relax in meditation practice, and by relax, I mean letting go of our sense of effort, goal, our attachment to uh, what we wish would be happening or what we think should be happening, and instead are able to just be with how we are and what actually is, uh, in that sense, then we begin to notice more and more uh, with Vipassana, combined with the precision of shamatha, so that we don't um, become distracted or be get lost in our perceptions, but we're able to just see what is without uh, getting lost. So the first of the four categories of, Vip of, categories of Vipassana is uh, called discriminating dharmas, which he also talked about as separating dharmas. Um, and in other texts, I've seen it referred as distinguishing dharma. So it's three different ways of really saying the same thing. And what Trungpa Rinpoche says about discriminating dharmas, this first category of Vipassana, is that when you develop awareness, when we develop awareness, we're aware of all the things that are happening in our lives and in our world, but we're not overwhelmed by it. The not overwhelmed piece, again, is that precision of shamatha that combines with Vipassana. Um, you're not overwhelmed. You can handle each situation according to its own merit, style, or virtue, and some kind of um, 
intelligence is working with, in you. So the idea of separating dharmas here, it's important to understand that ordinarily, conventionally, the way our minds work is that we p pile a lot of things all together. That rather than seeing things as we are, we have all of our labels, all of our habitual thinking, all of our prejudices. Um, and this makes it very difficult to actually work with things because we're seeing things the way we either hope or fear that they are, rather than the way they actually are. Uh, in the next chapter that John will be talking about, this um, called the, upon the six discoveries, there's a lot of examples of how things how we can separate things out in Vipassana. So, for instance, one of the discoveries, I don't want to go too much into it because that'll be John's part, but um, one of the discoveries is having a notion of time, being able to very clearly distinguish past, present, and future. And if we just think of our experiences in meditation practice where our intention is to stay present, but we all we get lost in past and future all the time, it's be precisely because we lump all these things together and we don't um, distinguish dharmas. We clump things together in, uh, you know, uh, in a confused way, habitual way. Um, and so we don't, aren't able to work with things with any kind of precision or accuracy or clarity. So seeing things as they are involves not lumping things together, but actually being able to discriminate each particular thing. Um, we're able to separate perception from our interpretations of perceptions. Um, we're actually, actually able to perceive things, work with things, think about things with less ego, without uh, any one fixed point of view. Um, and so he says that in the beginning, this kind of clear seeing, this kind of openness uh, can be a, quite a shock, like wearing a first pair of glasses, which resonated for me because at one time I didn't wear glasses and uh, driving one night missed an exit because I didn't read the sign soon enough and realized, I guess I need to get my eyes checked and found out that I did need glasses. And all these things that I thought off in the distance were blurry, actually you could see quite clearly with glasses on. So um, it was a bit of a shock. Um, in any case, as he says, with such clear seeing, we begin to realize how much we miss. And this could be simple things. You might notice sometimes after meditation practice that you see the floor needs sweeping or you realize that you know, the, the living room's gotten a bit cluttered or whatever it is. And you just, you know, in a very simple way, just relate to things as they are and um, you know, maybe straighten things up or organize. Um, he says that sometimes it might be so overwhelming that it becomes irritated that we want to wait, walk away from the nakedness or the directness of, you could say directness is another uh, word for nakedness in the Pashna experience, rather than face reality. But he says that turning away is due to a lack of awareness and a lack of mindfulness. It's a lack of a combination of shamatha and Vipassana, in other words. But in contrast, he says Vipassana is a natural process of brightening yourself up and seeing things clearly. So that's the first of the four categories of Vipassana. Um, so, as he says in other chapters, our beginning experiences of Vipassana have more of a shamatha element to them. But as we go on, it um, begins to develop more fully into um, a more open-ended Vipassana experience. So the second category is fully discriminating dharmas, or thoroughly discriminating, dharma, thoroughly distinguishing dharmas. And I should say dharmas here is not dharma in the sense of um, the teachings of the Buddha, but Dharma as things, any knowable thing is a Dharma. Any knowable thing, any experience is a Dharma. Um, he says at this stage, we're not only not startled by how detailed things are. Again, we're able to see very clearly, very precisely the details of things because we're able to separate Dharmas or discriminate Dharmas. But at this stage, we're not only not startled by how detailed things are, but we actually want to investigate them. And again, this is speaking to the inquisitive quality of Vipassana, the desire to um, see, look further, as he says, to further seeing, further looking, seeing further. Um, we want to investigate them. And with this, he says, we become more daring in relating with the world. And he gives a couple of examples of how this might work. Uh, one related, I guess you could say, to passion and one to aggression. The passion one was, he says, if you have subconscious pornographic gossip going on, some kind of fantasy, and if you do two weeks of solid meditation, those kinds of thoughts will come up, just to let you know. Um, 
you might at first be shocked, but then you want to find out where it's coming from. You want to actually look into it. You actually, again, you hold your seat rather than being so uh, either carried away or so uh, appalled or whatever it is you might feel. You actually want, just want to see, you want to understand what's happening. You want, as he says, you want to find out how these things occur and what they're like. You don't just close the door. You don't just push the experience away. Uh, which again is uh, an example of how aggression forestalls Vipassana, to push things away, then um, there's no seeing. Um, and the other example he gives is someone saying, fuck you on the street. Um, I had in my note to use a different example, but I'm right on the spot, I can't think of one, so I'll go with what he says. But the idea is you want to investigate, you want to understand. Um, what does that mean? He says, what kind of reaction do, how are, how are my feeling? How am I responding? Why did it happen? What is the environment? The idea is that we don't react habitually, but we can actually take a look. We can actually see further and then work with things as they are right on the spot. Um, and again, the shamatha and Vipassana work together. Part of that is that the steadiness of, Vipa, of shamatha allows us to do the looking that's involved in um, Vipassana. As he says, we look into awareness with how such situations happen. And essentially what this works, one way of understanding what this means, what it is that we're actually beginning to see here, looking into the nature of things, we begin to have some sense of the interdependence of things. We begin to see how causes and conditions come together. Uh, so that there might we might have a, a momentary experience of passion or aggression or whatever it is and we begin to look into the causes and conditions and with that begin to see the emptiness so to speak of the situation begin to see how if the same thing had happened in a different place in a different time when um, when we might be in a different mood or we might have different pressure or no pressure on us we might not feel the same way at all so that we begin to see situations with a little bit more spaciousness, you could say. Um, he does say as a warning here that this does not mean analyzing everything from a Freudian point of view, which means sort of a more of a sense of um, this means that. It's more an understanding that because of this, that happens, or because of this, this occurs. Um, it's not a question of looking into, as he says, whether your fantasies represent something else. But it, it's a question of direct experience, directly seeing how things come about. Uh, as he says, with Vipassana, we're looking at dharmas directly and finding out how they arise, dwell, and disappear. How they arise, dwell, and disappear. Uh, arise, how things arise, dwell, and disappear is a key uh, meditation in Mahamudra practice. But it's the same thing of looking at how, how causes and conditions come together. And it's just simply insight or clear thinking. And with that, we begin to understand something of the nature of things. The third uh, category of Vipassana is completely comprehending dharmas, or uh, in other texts, completely investigating dharmas. But here, and here he says, with this, we're experiencing thoughts, he says, of a very crude nature, the big ups and downs, which could be very aggressive, very passionate, or very ignorant. Um, and, whether, and he says, whether in uh, meditation practice or post-meditation practice, we could study them and look at them. You could exert your mindfulness on them. And he's very clear that this is a little, this is not the same as mindfulness of thoughts, where we're just seeing thoughts and labeling them thinking. Here, there's more of a general awareness of the presence of crude thoughts. And with awareness of the atmosphere created by crude thoughts, we're able to see such thoughts one by one, rather than being hit by some big thought and being completely overwhelmed. So I think the sense of seeing the awareness of the atmosphere here is important. We begin to see more of the connections between things. This relates again somewhat to understanding something of the causes and conditions that bring about what we experience, what we see, what we feel, and so on. But it's also a sense here in atmosphere of being able to accommodate, you know, having a sense of space you could say, with whatever we're experiencing. Um, we begin to have uh, some perspective on the kinds of feelings and moods that we might experience. Um, and so we, we're less likely to identify with them because we, we come to see them as, again, uh, passing phenomena, temporary phenomena, rather than taking them um, to have some reality that they don't have. 
there's more of a sense of how things connect together, which again relates to some, some idea, some notion of interdependence of things, how causes and conditions come together to create appearances, which uh, when causes and conditions change, uh, we realize are impermanent or temporary. Um, he says, when we practice insight, we're not overwhelmed because we're able to dissect our emotions from one from another. So again, it goes back to this ability to separate out and be able to see, again, see causes and conditions, uh, realize something of the atmosphere of the effect, how things connect together. Um, he says, you look at your thoughts and dissect them. You notice how they arise, how they dwell, and how they disappear. Um, and he says, even if they don't disappear, the first flash disappears. There's maybe an initial shock, initial surprise. Um, and then you have the chance to see the second flash coming into your state of mind. Um, and in this case, he actually uses the example of seeing a pterodactyl. Uh, so you don't panic and you uh, just examine what's happening here. You realize I'm not in prehistoric time. What's going on here? Um, an interesting example to work with. He also says that with this experience of Vipassana, we're able to work with these crude thoughts with some sense of accommodation, some sense of perspective, uh, some sense of non-identification with them as um, having a greater reality uh, or some solidification around them of, of ego, uh, that we, there's a sense of decency, which kind of makes sense because we're less pressured in our actions. We're less demanding. We're less panicked in our um, actions. We just simply see and dissect crude emotions. And we can do this. Um, he actually relates, relates it again back to shamatha practice. So again, shamatha and Vipassana work together. Uh, we can do this because of shamatha practice. And therefore, your mind can hand, handle anything that happens. Mind becomes like Play-Doh. So again, there's a sense of play a sense of openness, a sense of possibility, rather than uh, a panic sense that things definitely are uh, what we think they are based on our preconceptions, judgments, and habitual patterns of thinking. The fourth category is completely investigating dharmas, or uh, in other texts, completely analyzing. And this, he says, is a much more refined investigating, applying Vipassana to even minute thoughts, uh, small insignificant flickers, the little subconscious gossip that we have going on, the um, internal dialogue that we have going on uh, with ourselves, about ourselves, about the world, and about what we're doing. Um, and he'll say that sometimes it might seem like these small thoughts are being investigated by small awareness. So it looks like one subconscious gossip is chasing another subconscious gossip. That we might think we're perpetuating the whole thing, but he says that's not the case because the chaser has awareness. There's awareness of the thinking process. We're not, again, we're not caught up in it in a way where we lose uh, our, our overall sense that we are aware, that we are aware of, that we're th of this process going on uh, so that we're not caught up in it, entangled in it, identifying with it, getting lost in it. The idea of, he says, the idea of looking into this level of thought process, these small thoughts, uh, may seem very, may seem small, but the practice of Vipassana, he says, is very tidy and precise. You're, again, you investigate where these thoughts come from. So again, back to where they come from, where they dwell, and where they disappear. Uh, and with this, again, there's just a greater sense of openness. Uh, he goes on to say a few more things, com comparing uh, shamatha and vipassana, how they work together and how they're different and how they're the same. When we practice shamatha, he says, we're still involved with effort, hard work. Vipassana in itself is somewhat effortless, but it's more watchful. So in a sense, it takes more effort. The idea is that we're not allowing any gaps in our awareness. And again, ultimately, the, uh, the full maturation, full cultivation of Vipassana is what he calls 24-hour awareness. Um, when we practice mindfulness, you concentrate on one particular area, such as if, for instance, in shamatha, we work with the breath, even though there's a sense of environment beyond that. You concentrate on one particular area, and when you stop concentrating on that one area, you relax. But that relaxation is looked at by awareness. So the pinpoint 
again, that pinpoint of mindfulness, that pinpoint of shamatha, as well as the sense of general, general radiation is covered completely. That sense of general radiation, that sense of expansive awareness, panoramic awareness is the Vipassana experience that develops out of mindfulness practice. He says, our teachers have taught us that it's necessary to conquer both undisciplined mind and individualistic mind. Undisciplined mind, the mind that uh, gets caught up in wildness, distraction, drowsiness, dullness. Undisciplined mind is conquered by shamatha practice, while individualistic mind is conquered by vipassana. Vipassana, he says, is based on dealing with ego that wandering mind, confusion, and the inability to discipline oneself, all of these factors derive from the fundamental principle of ego. So that's what we're working with, or that's what we're letting go of, which we're working to see through, might be the best way to put it, with prajna, to actually come to some understanding, some experience of egolessness. That develops out of the prajna. And again, to go back to chapter 43, uh, the first chapter, um, um, in this Vipassana section, he says a gap of non-ego goes on continuously and through Vipassana we can relate with those momentary open gaps. Such gaps are unconditioned psychologically, unconditioned by dualism, unconditioned by passion, aggression, and ignorance. The gap is very sudden, a fraction of a second, but because of those gaps it's possible to insert Vipassana to relate with unconditioned mind. And then um, how do we sustain this practice? How do we sustain Vipassana? By, he says, disowning it, by not getting fixated on what we see, by letting go. Leave your, he says in another, in, um, another one of the chapters earlier here, he says to um, leave your gap alone. Because as soon as we fixate, this is it, then we're dealing with the thought of the past and we get into hopes of the future. And we made the very immediate past, but it's still, we're not present. We're now dealing with something that we, uh, is already a past experience. So the idea is that, that we actually sustain the Pashna by resting in it, by relaxing into it, by letting go in these gaps and not holding on. Um, the, to when we fixate on our experience, when we try to recreate the experience, we're either dealing with a memory of the past or a hope for the future. So that there's a constant letting go, a constant opening up, a constant relaxing of effort and struggle. He goes on to talk about, um, in this chapter, um, to ask, why do we do this? Why are we doing all these practices? Why is it, it's, it's not, he talks about it's not being just like doing gymnastic exercises to build ourselves up, but that it has to do with ego. It has to do with letting go of uh, individualistic mind. Um, and in fact, in the 79 seminary, transcripts, he actually says that talking about ego would be in his next talk, and, and uh, he goes on in the next three talks about, to talk about taking refuge, which is the ultimate letting go of um, individual goals, and taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, prajna, and twofold egolessness. But the point is that we could practice Vipassana, he says, during all our waking hours, whatever we're doing, showering, eating, taking a class right now, but we could practice that. So with that, I will turn it over to John to discuss the next chapter. Thank you, Michael. I want to go back to the definition of aggression. Um, one definition has to do with passion, aggression, and ignorance, the three poisons. And there, aggression has to do with uh, wanting something away out of your life. But an even more fundamental definition of aggression has to do with just not accepting things as they are, wanting to change them, having an agenda uh, that is different from the way things are evolving naturally in your awakened state, in your awakened mind. And so we impose our ideas on the world of the way things ought to be. And this is a more fundamental notion of aggression. And Vipassana is completely anti-aggression. It has nothing to do with imposing one's individualistic, conceptual ideas and emotions on anything. It has to do with awareness. 
awareness of what things actually are now in this present moment. So let's start by experiencing both shamatha and vipassana, if you would. Just take a mild meditation posture. Just become aware of your body really as you sit in wherever you're sitting or standing or whatever you're doing, <laughs> lying down even, um, that you become aware of your presence here. And now let's do some shamatha briefly. We are going to work with the breath. And you become aware of the breath. You breathe in, you breathe out, count one. Breathe in, breathe out, count two. Breathe in, breathe out, count three. Breathe in, breathe out, count four. When thoughts arise and take you your, to your attention, you notice that, you let it go, and you come back to awareness of the breath. Breathe in, breathe out, count five. Breathe in, breathe out, count six. Our awareness is on the breath as it comes in through the nostrils or the lips, if you prefer. You can feel it. Breathe in, breathe out, count six. Breathe in, breathe out, count seven. So we've been very focused on this very narrow sensation of the breath coming in and out of our nose or our lips of our body, in, going out, in, going out. And now you can expand your awareness to encompass everything that you're experiencing, this screen, the image on the screen, these sounds, the feeling of your body, the space around you. And instead of focusing your attention on something as small and precise as the breath, you come back to this. This is Vipassana. You can do it shamatha and Vipassana at the same time. You breathe in, you breathe out. Here we are, right here now. You're looking at me, hearing this voice. You're aware of your surroundings in the room. This is Vipassana and shamatha combined because there's the precision, the particularness, the detail of shamatha, that minute focus within this broader space of awareness of the room, this present moment, only now. It's only happening right now, this space. Shamatha and Vipassana, they go together. And as Rinpoche is going to be saying in these two chapters, they're indis in <laughs> indispensable each for the other. The ultimate practice is the combination of these two. The precision of Shamatha coming back from thoughts, from dreams to awareness, and then the awareness expands and it encompasses anything and everything that is happening in this present moment. I want to give you something. This is from a wonderful book I'm reading, and I keep telling you about it, Enlightened Vagabond, about Patro Rinpoche. And um, I have put a document in chat called Patro's Pointing Out Instructions for, and then I forget what it, who it's for, it's for a vagabond beggar. Uh, and the document is there and you can read it. Let's read it together actually. I'm gonna put it up on screen. I hope. Mm, yeah, here it goes. Patrol's pointing out instruction for an old nomad. 
And this really is all about shamatha and vipassana combined. Don't ruminate about the past. Don't anticipate the future. Don't cogitate about the present. Not tampering with it, leave mind just as is. This is Vipassana Shamatha. This very instant, aware, relaxed. Beyond this, there's not a damn thing. <laughs> and that's Let's see, I've got to turn this off, stop sharing. That's Patra Rinpoche's version of what we're talking about here tonight. And you're going to, there are a few people who came in later may not get that document. The rest of you have it. And I'll put it back in later. And the people who came in later, if you want, can download it too. Um, it's really just pith. <laughs> so, um, we're on chapter 48, sharpening one's perception. Uh, this is all about the six discoveries. And he starts off by saying, whatever is knowable in the world of either relative or transcendent nature can be understood and experienced by means of Vipassana meditation. Vipassana leads to a complete understanding of the knowable. Ultimately, Vipassana is simply the awareness of this now. And we are switching our allegiance from thoughts, which are like labels that are scotch taped onto our experience, from that to the experience itself, which only arises now. And you can't hold on to it. You can't cogitate on it, as Patra Rinpoche says. You can only experience it as it flows in the moment, constantly changing. So the six discoveries, six attributes of the Vipassana experience are the product of intellectual sharpness, not being lost in stories is what that means, that is developed through Vipassana. When we get lost in stories, we disappear. We get fuzzy, we know we're barely here, we're here partly. But when we're clear in Vipassana, it's just right here now. It's the only time. In fact, it isn't even a time. You can't hold on to it, you can't point to it. It's gone the instant you try. So the first one is called meaning, discovering the meaning of words. Tun Sola. Sola, sola means discovery. And dun means meaning, like dun dam, absolute meaning, absolute truth. He says this is an understanding of the discovery, really, of the difference between experience and language. So now you're beginning to discover how language works, concepts works. He says you are developing the trust in yourself that you have the potential for knowledge and wisdom, which goes beyond language. That the Dharma is a matter of waking up to what is already there or here, rather than painfully acquiring what you don't have. So you're not getting more knowledge. What you're doing is waking up to this here and now. He says, um, you begin to appreciate, you see, what language actually is, that it's a grammatical construction that is overlaying the experience, the real experience that you have, like a label. It's like you write the word table on a piece of tape and put it on your table that you're sitting at. The table is actually there. The word table on the tape is just a label. That's language. So we're not being asked to speak a pidgin English. The idea is that you begin to sync your language with your state of mind. So if you're going through the door, you say, you're holding the door for someone, you say, I'm holding the door for you because that's what you're doing. There's a synchronization between language and experience that begins to happen. Vipassana of discipline allows us to ponder our thinking process and how we relate with words and to synchronize it with our experience. The second form is called discovering the objects of inside and outside. 
and we're beginning to discriminate between inside, which is personal emotions, and the outside, which is the objective external setup. This is uh, also called the search for reality. And um, so you're beginning to see the greater importance of going out and giving rather than holding back because you've discovered this difference between inside what you're thinking and feeling and outside, which is what is really happening. Thinking and feeling are in your imagination. And they begin to become synchronized. What's actually happening and what you're thinking and feeling. Number three is discovering the nature of perception. You first perceive your world by thought which is translated into immediate experience. This is the same thing again. If someone is rude or aggressive to you, you're able to look beyond that to the causal characteristic of that person's aggression reactions. So you don't get caught up in the surface descriptions of things. You begin to see what's really going on now in the present moment. Number four, directions, discovering sides. It's about knowing what to do and what not to do. And you're able to detect what is wholesome and what is not wholesome. And what is not wholesome lies in the conceptual thoughts, the passions, the descriptions, the wishes for and against, as opposed to response, responsiveness in the moment to what is really happening, which is all part of the Vipassana, waking up. He says, you have a natural instinct and an allegiance for what is right and what is not. You're relating with the common norms of good and bad, but with tremendous wisdom and clarity. So the Pashana allows you to see beyond your preconceptions, beyond your habitual trainings, to the wholesomeness and unwholesomeness in given situations as they are happening now, and to respond to that accurately, responsibly, appropriately. Number five, discovering past, present, and future. And this is really like that uh, Papa Rinpoche quote, that we're not confusing the past, the present, and the future. The past is gone. The future hasn't arrived. And the present, it's indescribably changing in the moment, right now, and we're living it. This is dealing with paranoia. We're dealing with our fear that the past will repeat in the present or the future, or we're dealing with experiencing the future as a present threat or problem. All of those are imaginary. The instruction in a nutshell is that you could take advantage of your present situation. You have power over the present right now. So we're really letting go of any kind of reference point, past, future, and present, and dealing with this life as it comes up in the moment, here, real. He says, in fact, the past is contained in the present, and the present will breed the future. So you've got all three right here. You know how to act now. You have power over the present. And because of this realization, you don't feel trapped in any way. You have confidence and dignity. He says, by practicing Vipassana discipline, you are trying to get out of karmic encirclement. The karmic encirclement comes from feeling that you are trapped by the past and your future is dictated. You're trying to cut through karmic cause and effect. The feeling that I must do it this way or that way. So that you can realize your dignity and elegance. You can be arrogant in the positive sense because you can cut through the vicious circle of karma by applying the techniques that have presented to you, been presented to you. The Pashana techniques, coming back, resting here and now, awake, aware, giving your, shifting your loyalty from concepts, from thoughts to this. That is the realization of the discovery of time. 
Number six is discovering knowledge. And again, it's pretty much the same thing. You're discovering the power of cause and effect, which means karma, We're allowing of the kleshas. You feel, well, if that cause happened in the past, it's going to produce an effect in the future. And you get caught up in the anticipation of that positive or negative. Instead, you could come into the present and work with what's really happening one way or the other. So finally, he concludes with a section called Applying the Six Discoveries. They aren't something to look for. They're behaviors or patterns that develop these six discoveries. They just develop because of your shifting your loyalty from dreams of the past and future to simple, clear awareness in this present moment. We're beginning to become a very different kind of person. Someone who lives now. He says, and this is, you're going to find out more and more that this is true all the way through Tantra. Vipassana is the heart of Buddha Dharma. Vipassana is the heart of Buddha Dharma. It is the key. A Buddhist has clear thinking and an objective view of the world. That's what Vipassana gives you. There is no chance that such a person will be swayed by fascinations or extremes. <clears throat> yeah, so Vipassana exhausts your expectation of anything surprising or extraordinary. And I just think of from Rinpoche, feigning surprise at times. <laughs> um, so you can use it to deal with pain, which involves fear, and you just see it, and you come back to awareness. You're discovering how much space pain occupies and how much space pleasure occupies, and you come back. As for time, it is involved within the duration of pain, and, and with insight, you have the overview. You're reviewing all. So the six discoveries are the result of the clear awareness of Vipassana and the thinking that goes along with it. The result of the process of seeing very precisely. You're not trying to create something. These six aspects are behaviors or patterns that develop. The more you give your awareness, your loyalty, your attention to now, to this here and now. Again, he says it's the heart of Buddha Dharma. It sets the tone for the psychology of Buddhism, Vipassana, and it's in union with Shamatha. Shamatha means coming back from dreams to awareness, to mindfulness. And having come back, we don't have to be aware of just something as narrow as the breath. We can be aware of this. He says there's no chance such a person will be swayed by fascinations or seductions of, of Vipassana. He says if you're in a state of Vipassana, so what? Here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's just reality. So in Buddhism, we're doing more than purely relating to our meditation practice in the shrine hall. We're training how to live our lives everywhere. Then the last chapter we're dealing with is called Self-Perpetuating Awareness. And what he's saying is that the Vipassana you develop in Vipassana, you develop a sense that the world contains its own intelligence. It's right here now. Vipassana isn't something that you're laying onto it. It's something you're tuning into, this open space of awareness and intelligence. So you don't need to add anything onto it. You just tune into it. You're simply relating to color, form, and experience. The very fact of so-called reality begins with the reality that you have a body, you have sense perceptions. And the purpose of Vipassana 
is to fully experience and communicate those sense perceptions, sight, sound, smells, tastes. You're not lost in the complexities of thought. You never miss an inch. The point is that you experience reality, this, as real, now. You're so in your burning conceptual mind, he quotes at some point Jam Gun Control to that effect. So fixed concepts, shapes, and colors arise, but they're like firewood. That is, through the experience of Vipassana, apparent phenomena, all the sights and sounds, are seen as fuel. <clears throat> There is no difference between the phenomenal world and its occupants, me, you, the chair, the window. They are one. When the fuel of fixed concepts is burned up by the fire of the passion of discipline, we have nothing to hang on to. When the fuel of fixed concepts is burned up by the fire of the passion of awareness, we have nothing to hang on to. And discovering nothing to hold on to, we find that the whole thing just is a constant dissolving. Now he talks about Rikpa. Rikpa is the Tibetan for the Sanskrit Vidya. And it has two levels. One is simply sort of mechanical intelligence, your ability to understand how a machine functions, how weather changes, how, whatever, it's very ordinary, it's science, um, it's understanding of the world. And then there's the ultimate version of Rikpa, which is really the Pashana perfected. It's ultimately clear awareness, here and now, effortless. We rest in it, it's already here for us. He says, in the larger vision of Vipassana, beautiful flower petals and dog shit on the pavement are the same. And what he means by that is that our awareness of them is the same. At the same time, dog shit is still seen as dog shit and a flower is still seen as a flower. It's not like you get dumb because discriminating awareness remains. Discriminating awareness is that sort of lower level of Rikpa, of Vidya. He says, despite burning concepts by coming back to this awareness, we are still even more intelligent. That's the Rikpa. We see more clearly. We get lots smarter. Concepts make us dumber. Rikpa is the instigator of Vipassana, that intelligence. It wakes us up. He says, although we may not yet have experienced it, there is such a thing as complete awareness beyond the techniques of breathing meditation and walking meditation. And this is the ultimate Rikpa, this complete awareness that's always here that we can tune into. We might not expect that there could be a state that is completely clear and empty, spacious, without any problems. However, it is possible, and we could experience it, a state that is completely clear and empty, spacious, without any problems, here, now. This is what we're heading towards. This is the refinement of the Pashana. The space we live in is filled with perceptions and non-perceptions. It is like breathing pollution and fresh air simultaneously. This is our normal way of being. In Vipassana, we relate with both. We see our confusions, our perceptions, our concepts, but the emphasis is on the fresh air, the space, the clarity, which has tremendous understanding and wisdom in it. So Vipassana experience, the real Vipassana, is total, and it goes beyond techniques and beyond mindfulness. 
Techniques and mindfulness can trigger it. But then when it really happens, it's beyond any technique, beyond any kind of mindfulness. Vipassana awareness expands and opens constantly. We could call it active space, self-perpetuating space, or self-perpetuating awareness. It's always here. You can just come back to it at any time. It's not like you're going to lose it. You might get lost in a dream for a while, and then you wake up, and here it is. And what we're doing is we're beginning to shift our allegiance from the dreams of concepts of thoughts and emotions to this intelligent, voiceless, conceptless awareness here, always now. He says, the fire, which is the discipline, and the wood, conceptual mind, are burned up and dissolve into open space. This is Vipassana. It's a growing up process, Vipassana. You're growing up from the childishness of conceptual dreaming. You discover there are lots of things that your parents haven't told you, but you pick up yourself you learn a great deal about the world, discover a lot of details. And in this awareness, space and awareness are one. This is what we practice in the morning, coming back to this space that we're inhabiting now, and it is intelligent. The awareness, the intelligence is here in the space. They are the same thing. He says it right in this chapter, space and awareness are one. This is key. It'll take you all the way to Dzogchen, to great perfection teachings at the very end of the path. So shamatha produces peace. Vipassana produces reality. Through Vipassana, you begin to realize how much of the world you have missed. You begin to pay attention to it, all the subtleties of the beauty of the, this world as it arises and passes. He says, by joining shamatha and vipassana, you begin to experience the world as if the sun and moon were put together, or for that matter, as if your right and left eyes were put together, or your right and left ears. Vipassana, in, earlier in the chapter, he said, it's like when you have vipassana, it's like putting on glasses for the first time. Suddenly you can see. It's like having cataract surgery, oh yeah. Um, and suddenly you realize you were looking through a, a, a what's that phrase? Uh, a glass darkly. You were looking through a glass darkly. And when the cataracts are removed, suddenly everything is bright and clear. This is Vipassana. Through Shamatha and Vipassana, you could have a cheerful, celebratory life, maintaining both your cheerfulness and your discipline, the discipline of coming back from dreams. Shamatha and Vipassana work together. Shamatha, remember, mindfulness coming back from dreams, Vipassana awareness. They're like the sky and earth, ocean and land, sun and moon, the seasons. So we've got about 20 minutes. We can have a discussion. This is volume one of the profound treasury. It's hilarious. I mean, this is so profound. Yeah, Temple Kensei said Trimba Rinpoche taught, he taught the backwards path of Ati, of Dzogchen. This is really so full of Dzogchen. And we're lucky to receive it. Wake us up. Any comments, questions? We take complaints. <laughs> it's 
Steve. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused about in, the, in these teachings, uh, uh, he's talking about learning to experience the world, experience reality, relate to phenomena of the real world. And I'm a little confused as how that relates to previous teachings about emptiness, which seems to imply that it's all an illusion. And so I'm not quite sure how those two ideas or concepts relate, if you could talk about that. We'll come more to emptiness. Emptiness is not saying um, Vipassana really is the doorway to emptiness, to shunyata. Because ultimately what shunyata is, is about seeing things stripped of concept. The concepts of things, good and bad, existing, not existing, past, present, and future, all of those clothe this that we're sitting in the midst of. And by clothing it, it's like you're dressing it up. It's like you're creating a false something. Vipassana is about stripping off that conceptual clothing and seeing things nakedly. There is where shunyata dwells. Shunyata is about a description of all of this phenomena without concept. So, I don't know, is this helping? Um, yeah, I, 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 I follow you that far. It's when I go to then uh, the, the concept or the idea of emptiness. Once you've stripped away those concepts, is emptiness then the absence of those concepts? That's the emptiness. That's what phenomena, this world is empty of. It's oh. empty of these conceptual descriptions. Emptiness is that. The ultimate emptiness that it's empty of is the idea of things existing or not existing. Those are just a concept too. Those are just ideas. And we strip that out. That's what emptiness is about, shunyata. Things are empty of our concepts. So really, shunyata is, a, is about the ultimate vipassana. And we begin to describe this world that we're experiencing, or that is being experienced, or that is arising and passing. It's hard to even say anything about it, you know, actually, because it's beyond words. And shunyata begins to try and describe it in a new way, without the conceptual description and distinctions of existence and non-existence. Michael, can you help with this? This is such a profound question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think first thing is to remember that illusory or empty doesn't mean that there's nothing there. Uh, it just means that it doesn't exist in the way that we think it does. Um, and if we're able to see things like John is saying, free of concepts, free of labels, free of preconceptions, um, then actually what we experience is the fullness of things, the vividness of things, because there's no barrier. Um, it's easy to, to kind of mix up emptiness with nothingness because, uh, because we see things as existing in the way that we don't. We kind of conceptually have to undo that somewhat. Although the more we practice meditation, the more we might have a direct experience of it. But we kind of approach it conceptually by negating. Um, but ultimately, it's uh, being free, as John says, it's being free of any ideas about what something is and just seeing what it is. And that's where that's what Vipassana is, it's just seeing it as it is. I don't I think that a little bit. And one thing to, that is pointed out, Trim Rinpoche points this out a lot, is that when one sees in this way, one is seeing the world as art. 
as a constant arising of beauty and passing away. It's like you're taking the conceptual lenses off your eyes and seeing the vividness of this world. And in fact, beyond emptiness, the next teaching that is given is the teaching of luminosity. They are two sides of the same coin. They go together. When one begins to understand and experience emptiness, the emptiness of concept, the world is seen in much more luminous, vivid, full of color and meaning. So viv emptiness in the tantric teachings, shunyata and luminosity, luminosity the term is, is ursel in Tibetan. There are two sides of the same reality. Shunyata is really the corrective. It's getting rid of the error. The error being believing in the conceptual labels and, and constantly living with them. Not being able to see the world as it truly is, but only through the veil of concept. And luminosity has to do with when one begins to really perfect the pashana, you want to call it that, shunyata experience, then the world emerges very, very vividly, luminous. Ursel literally means ur is light, cell is luminous, luminous light, and they go together through your time and so. So we're being invited into a beautiful, beautiful world full of meaning and vividness. And artists, he, he talks about this in that last class where we, we talked about that. He, he constantly talks about the creation of art. Um, in out of coming out of um, vipassana meditation. Thank you. I think that helps. I'll have to uh, contemplate that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Maybe another way to think of it is um, the gaps that he talked about, where he talks about gaps that are unconditioned psychologically, unconditioned by dualism, unconditioned by passion, aggression, and ignorance that we just experience in moments in meditation. In those gaps, we're fully here and now. And um, when we're actually fully present, things look different to us. We experience things differently. Um, and I actually thought about it because uh, I've read an, uh, an article about, this is weird, this is a loose analogy, so I think it's a little for now. But it was an, um, an article about uh, quantum physics and how on a certain level things work the way, you know, conventional, the way that Newtonian physics say. But you get down to the micro level um, and in quantum physics things act very differently. And I think it, it, analogously, analogously, when we're fully present, things look different to us. Um, we kind of realize that, you know, we don't take them to be permanent, same old, same old. We don't take them to be kind of dull or, you know, drown out. They're vivid and they're clear and they're present. Um, and they change. They're constantly changing. And we're, that's, that's really what emptiness is about. It's when we get stuck in the concept that things are fixed. Uh, you know, as it says in the chant, whatever arises is fresh. And we rest without altering that. That's that's the beginning of that kind of experience. You know, when children are developing, um, you take a baby. Infants are born at about the level of a third skanda. That's impulse. They're just beginning to develop concepts. So one of the first things babies learn is, you know, milk. A word like milk, or mama or whatever, you know, something like that. Now, they learn very, very primitive words to label things. And as they grow bigger, the, their vocabulary enlarges. And I remember, I always remember this story of my daughter, when she was a toddler, walking around the house and putting her hand on the stove and getting a little burned. And my wife said to her, hot, hot. Mm -hmm. So 
for a long time after that, whenever she walked by the stove, whether it was turned on or off, she didn't care. She'd point to it and she'd say, hot. I see Carolyn nodding her, nose, her head. This is the way we operate when we grow up. We begin to develop a conceptual vocabulary. But in those early years, we are seeing with the eyes of Vipassana, the world is much more vivid. And if we can remember childhood memories like that, they can be very vivid. And I have one. I grew up in Kentucky and when I, in my young years. And I still have this memory of my grandfather taking me fishing one early morning as the sun was rising, just beginning to break above the horizon. And we were walking through this huge field of rolling hills of grass. And we crested a hill and we looked down and there was a, a pool of water with us where we were going to go fishing. And the memory of that is so vivid, so clear, so damp with the moisture of that morning. And my father, my grandfather, and his presence next to me, that's the absence of concept in a young child. I, I must have been about five, four, four or five years old. We had fishing poles over our, our shoulders. <laughs> so I'm telling you this story because each one of us has this. And I'm sure you can search your memory and find something vivid like that. It might be beautiful, it might be painful. It could be a painful memory. It doesn't have to be vivid, I mean, uh, beautiful, but vivid, yes. Fred. Such a profound set of teachings right here. I, I, it's like, I, like you said, it, it's a joke that this is the intro. And, and there's so many things I want to say here. Uh, got a limitation of time, but um, how he, how Rinpoche closes that, you know, uh, about, you know, unification of the sun and the moon, the, the left and the right eyes. I remember maybe a few years ago, you would talk often about how enlightenment was through the eyes. There's a major hint there. And I feel like Rinpoche is pointing us towards there. Can you speak any more to that from your own experience or realization? They say that the eyes are the most powerful gateway to enlightenment of the senses, but it doesn't have to be. You know, there can be other senses too. But the eyes are very powerful as a gateway to experiencing that vividness, that freshness, that luminosity and emptiness. They go together, the emptiness and the luminosity. The lu emptiness and luminosity are inseparable. You may experience one more than the other at different times, and that's our idiosyncrasies as we develop. But ultimately, they're the same. Valerie. Well, we, oh, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. I just sent John a chat saying, possibly Helen Keller had this experience this kind of experience because she didn't have sight or hearing, but she wrote some very profound philosophical things. She had, I think, a luminous experience in her life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many things you could point to. I always wondered, Trungpa Rinpoche said that one way to get to this experience of intense luminosity and, and emptiness is through the path that we're discussing. But another way is through insanity. Extreme insanity can produce momentary flashes of this. It's as though you get so crazy that your mind 
sort of is vibrating and suddenly just can't vibrate anymore and stops. And in those moments of it stopping, he said, it's like you reach a peak of a mountain. You can't stay there. You're going to come down the other side. But for that instant that you're there, you might see this luminosity and emptiness. And I asked him, I said, could Van Gogh have been experiencing that in his paintings, like the paintings from Arles? He thought so, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the Metallica song, One, when they talk about, uh, they're singing about a guy who has no arms, no legs, no, you know. And I, I, I'm like, oh, this almost sounds like he's ready to realize emptiness, this guy. He has no sight, no vision. And I'm like, okay, so I guess that's, my perception was on there. That's good to know. I think a lot of great poetry is concocted with that vision, that awareness. I think of Coleridge in some of his poems, other people in Xanadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. <laughs> Lots of poetry. Carolyn is saying, I wonder if that experience could be dot, dot, dot. Misunderstood and attributed to the wrong thing, maybe in cases of terror, probably. I'm thinking about, um, you know, like the theory of the sublime and how somebody like Hitler could create this thing in people and then they attributed it to him, if that makes any sense. Maybe. I don't know. I'm trying to remember a talk I heard once. It was more about sound and sound emptiness. But the basic idea is in listening to a piece of music, um, it's the very impermanence of the notes that makes the music. It's the lack of substance or the change. That's what makes a piece of music beautiful. If it was just one note constantly, it would be something completely different. So it's the, in, the impermanence, the emptiness of the sound that actually creates its beauty. Well, it's not just sight, like I said. It actually applies to any of the senses. Any of the senses. Yeah. Well, it's almost time to end. Anybody else? No. So we can discuss this some more tomorrow. You can think of instances of emptiness and luminosity. That'll become in Tantra. It's almost like a, a, a theme song, emptiness and luminosity, the way they go together. There you talk about sacred world. Exactly, sacred world. Yeah. And when Trimpa Rinpoche gave us the Shambhala teachings, all about enlightened society, it's all, all about seeing the world through this kind of a lens. If it's, you can't even call it a lens, stripped of lenses. That's what Shambhala was about is about. Well, shall we say the closing chants? Yep, I'll put them up. Okay. And I'll mute everyone. We're going to mute everybody or not? Yes, we are. Yeah, I'll unmute myself. We will close by reciting a prayer for peace and dedicating the merit generated through our practice and study for the benefit of all sentient beings. By the blessings of enlightened and compassionate ones, 
by the power of my positive actions of three times and my prayers of pure aspiration, may wars, conflicts, epidemics, and all other maladies dissolve in this world. And may the earth and all who live on this earth enjoy the abundance of well-being. May all learn to live lovingly with each other. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory.